Um, Tyan Ng Chan is a Hamilton-based writer, researcher, and media artist. Um, she works in experimental cinema, photography, poetry, and processes of mapping. Um, and her current projects, projects explore object-oriented storytelling. And she is a founding member of the Hamilton Perambulatory Unit, um, which she's going to talk about. I think a little bit, right? Yeah, a little, yeah, a little bit. And uh, which is an artist research collective that performs, uh, that creates uh, per performative walking events. And she also teaches in the Department of Media Art at York University. So, Tyann, thank you. Christine. Hi, everyone. This has been really great panels. Thank you for organizing it. It's been like such a day of learning. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so we're talking about research creation. What the heck is research creation? Does, do mo most of you know what that is even? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you guys know. It's a funding category? <laughs> it's a funding category, yeah. Totally a funding category. Um, broadly, the, a lot of the effort has been put into sort of like defining, right? Like what is research creation? Uh, how is it used? What are the methodologies? So, and so personally, what, what I do is um, my techniques is basically making place out of non-place, right? So uh, very, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so non-place is the idea that more and more of the world uh, has no distinguishing features that make it a place, right? And these are like malls, strip malls, the highway, um, transit, airports. And so how do we make place? Right, which is uh, often you know, uh, can stories, memories, narrative, experience. Right? These are all place-making things. So what I do with the, the Hamilton Perambulatory Unit, uh, or HPU as we call ourselves, if you don't want to say the super long name, um, is we give walking events and mapping events. So a lot of our things are partic participatory and relational. Right? So we do, uh, we use all these methodologies. So a lot of this is where the research comes in, right? So we're bringing in a lot of theories and literature from social science. Um, it's very, very interdisciplinary. So we have social science, uh, geography, cartography, ethnography, autoethnography. What else is up there? Um, psychogeography, right? Is, you know, basically this using the body as a sensing tool to move through space, documenting these things, and then of course having to share our results, right? So these, this is all part of the research uh, elements um, when we're working in a university, right? We're researching, and how do we do that in creative methods? So the actual research is creative. Um, it's performative workshops which make relations. So that's part of the art part of it, is making relationships um, to place as well as t uh, between people. Um, and there's a lot of like mobile media apps as well that help you do this. So some of these are like Drift, Dergive, Serendipiter, um, inter Indeterminate Hikes. These are all, some of them don't exist anymore because as we know, part of the research um, process is based on grants, and once the grant ends, what happens, right? The, the, the work disappears. So documentation is like a really necessary part of this. Um, but a lot of these apps are um, helping you to move through space and get lost, right? Because how can we get lost these days? Everybody has GPS on their phones and maps. So getting lost is like a large part of this. Um, so what we do as HPU is we help you move through space, and sense the space around us. And these, this can be in form of our strata walk, which is one of our methodologies, and that is looking at all the different layers that make up place. And the layers can be infinite. It can be anything, right? So these are some of our suggestions, like sign strata. So as you move through, you look through texts, and you identify what text um, systems those texts belong to. Uh, for instance, street signs, Graffiti can be like inter interventionist or poetic text, uh, colonial text. I love that on UBC here, you have many different languages on the signs, and that's like uh, highlighting you know, the different social um, aspects and historical aspects of place. You know, architectural strata, 
inanimate strata, electrical strata, like where does the electricity come from? Shiny strata, you know, what are the shiny things? Attraction strata, which uh, refers back to the situationists who walked, you know, according to what repels and attracts you. Uh, audio strata, tactile strata, you know, so these can go on. We have more. Story strata, right? What kind of stories can be told about a place? Cinematic strata, right? So what images uh, are overlaid on a place that we can find through movies? Rhythm strata, that's a nod to Henri Lefebvre's rhythm analysis. So what kinds of rhythms can you find in a place? So this is like a, a framework of how do you approach placemaking, which is like a large part of our research. And so these are some of the maps that have come up through some of the walks that we have held as the HPU. For instance, this is um, the animal strata, so looking at all the animals. So as we're walking around in a group, uh, generally we'll, each person has a different strata because it's really hard to focus right, on more than two strata at a time, really. Uh, this is graffiti strata. So somebody went and, and documented all the graffiti that they saw on this block around um, the AGH, that's the Art Gallery of Hamilton, where we had this walk. This is a color, I think, color strata. This is um, leaves, tree strata. There's another one. Trees are very popular. And this is... I'm really sure this is. I think it's Wi-Fi strata, you know? So when you look on your phone and you see all the different Wi-Fi's that pop up, and so somebody had actually mapped those on, uh, on this trip. And so, um, so this is the research part, and this is part of the dissemination. So, so I work very interdisciplinary, right? So I am in cinema, media arts. Uh, I also do, you know, these relational walks, which are kind of performative. And also some of my work is in visual arts, so the gallery space, the white box. Um, and so some of this research goes into a, an interactive video sculptural installation that I did. And this is the table that you can see at, uh, this is at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, part of a show called Hamilton Now Object. And this is what it looks like up close. So, um, oh, and this is another one, another iteration at Waterloo. And I think this was in Windsor, right? So it's site specific. Everywhere that it's shown, you know, I have to reconfigure the map and the, um, the sculptural elements. The sculptural elements are made out of uh, plaster uh, poured into food object containers. So it's on this kitchen table. So it invokes like the, the mundane and the everyday. And um, does this autoplay? Click on it? Yeah. Click on it with what? <laughs> Click ahead again. Click ahead. Oh, there you go. Yeah, all right. So basically, this is one of the dissemination um, methodologies of this research, which is it, um, it's interactive, as you see. And it's the idea of what is a city when you first approach it, it's a blank space, right? There's nothing because we don't know anything about it. And then the first layer that we find is generally Google Maps, right? So when we interact with the table, this is the Google Map layer. But there's different layers. And the higher you go, the more personal the layers become. So there's another second layer, which is images of the place. And then the third layer uh, incorporates some of these strata maps that, we, that were done um, as part of the workshop. And you have to go really far up like this to access that layer and, and it incorporates all the different strata maps from the participants. And I think that's my time. I've gone a little bit over. So I'm sorry. Uh, but this is, this is also some of the publications because I feel that if you don't write about it, if you don't disseminate, disseminate it um, you know, and document it, it might as well not have existed. Right, because it, it doesn't impact things unless you write and document about it. So see, these are some of the, uh, the documentation of some of the, uh, the strata mapping methodologies and other methodologies that we've, we've worked with at, as HPU and my, my own personal work as well. well that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'd love to introduce... Introdu uh, Do you want me to stay here? Yeah, yeah, hop up. Pick your favorite stool. Um, Dr. Claudia Krebs, if you would join us on the, on the days. Uh, she's a professor of teaching in the UBC Department of Cellular and Physical Sciences. 
She teaches gross anatomy and neuroanatomy, and she's also a scholar in medical education research, in particular, the use of technology in the classroom. And she works to make the biology of the brain more accessible to students and people around the world, and is the celebrated creator of some incredibly cool um, viral videos something like that, um, that explain neuroanatomy. Um, she also created the hollow brain, which is an AR teaching tool for neuroanatomy and instruction. So welcome, Claudia. And then Conrad. Uh, Conrad Sly, uh, he can make a 3D model of anything you can think of. So Conrad, do you want to come up to the stage too? Oh, it's a different guy. I was like, it's a guy with a hat. <laughs> I was like, do you have a presentation? I am so sorry. I was like, it's that guy. <laughs> I was like, it's the guy with the hat towards the back, and there's like five of you. So thanks. Thanks, guys, <laughs> with the hats. Hey, Conrad, how's it going? I'm Justine. It's super nice to meet you. Who's that guy? Get out of here. <laughs> He's a 3D artist and texture specialist, um, and you have a master in digital media from UBC, right? Here. Uh, uh, technically, SFU is the, the center for digital Whatever. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, guys, thanks for coming up to this beautifully created stage on here. I'm, I really am not a stool fan, but I'm going to do it for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Hey, how's it going? Um, so we're talking about the research creation process. Um, What's, what comes first, the, like uh, a walk through research or trying to solve a problem? What do you think, Claudia? I think it, the first thing is trying to solve a problem. If you yeah. don't have a problem you need to solve, then what are you doing, right? Yeah. Um, and so in, in my group, um, which is the Hive, which is our sort of biomedical visualization and communication space, um, we go from a problem and then look at possible technological solutions to address that, especially for education. So as you mentioned, I teach neuroanatomy yeah. and there's this phenomenon worldwide, worldwide called neurophobia. So that's the sort of unexplainable fear of the brain or the fear of learning about the brain. And it is a, sort of a, a pandemic among all medical students. Um, and so how do you, how do you approach that. So what Kendra was talking about, like nobody being literate about the climate crisis, it really mm. resonated yeah. with me because um, we live in a complete science communication crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and so I saw it in the classroom with students kind of blocking all information about the brain. And the only solution to overcome that mm -hmm. at first was just sort of partnering with artists to find um, a, an approach. So we started with video and then branching out into emerging technologies to find more engagement with our students um, so that we can uh, really see what will work to, um, to get them to acquire the knowledge mm -hmm. and then use it. Um, and then we take the next step, which is, the, so you've created something cool, like maybe the hollow brain, mm -hmm. and the question is, well, does it work? Does anybody <laughs> learn with this, or is it just kind of cool? Um, and, and I guess the same thing for other projects would be, you did this wonderful thing, but does anybody change their carbon behavior now, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you always want to close that loop, like mm -hmm. what has the impact been, and so then we study that. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Fascinating, thank you. Mm. Conrad, um, solving a problem or <laughs> a walk through the research? Uh, well, for me, for the, for the past two years, it's been like all research. Okay. I've had to essentially work as a one-man CGI pipeline, and, and the previous company I worked for. So just like finding inspiration in learning about and mastering the technology um, that is constantly evolving with patches and new additions and you know like and, and keeping track of that stuff. So like researching that and then getting to a level of understanding with it to um, be able to map a path towards using it creatively mm -hmm. and, and finding the problem that that tool and and that specific tool a specific thing can help um, you know speak to those problems mm -hmm. yes. and, and that's sort of what I explored doing my uh, undergraduate degree mm -hmm. at Emily Carr when I was approaching these technologies semi naively and uh, um, just trying to figure out what I could do with something that was so complex from a technological standpoint. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Cool. Diane? 
So walking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we definitely walk <laughs> through the research. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, an iterative, uh, co-constitutive problem in that we, you know, we start in a place with walking, mm-hmm. we analyze the place, but from there, mm-hmm. you know, sets of problems always emerge, and then we think about how do we address that. And the problems tend to be uh, around what, what, what we call the spatial imaginary. Mm-hmm. And this really does resonate, um, again, like with the climate crisis, you know, constructing that imaginary, that, that narrative. Um, and this is a lot of our research as well. How do you construct a spatial imaginary that has um, political power or mm-hmm. political will, right? And part of this is, you know, how do we change how people think about place? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of our work right now is with de- decolonization. How do we decolonize place? Mm-hmm. How do we indigenize place? And a lot of this is having to do with mapping, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that goes, it's a very circular kind of mm-hmm. problem. So Claudia, the, like a signature obviously aspect of the discipline of medicine is fundamental research, research-based and evidence-based work. Um, what evidence or research did you use to realize that, ah, VR, AR is the right tool for me to use to approach uh, neuroanatomy instruction? Well, it's interesting because I think the field for how to explore that is changing. And mm-hmm. a lot of my colleagues sort of in the biomedical field, they're very, we're very used to sort of a two cohort crossover, double blind, controlled, whatever right. kind of study. Right. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't really work right. for this type of um, mm-hmm. research. So we do more behavioral research um, by looking at how do people interact with it, um, mm-hmm. do, do the number of interactions influence how they do on mm-hmm. the test, and, and those types of things. So we borrow a lot from uh, psychology, we borrow uh, methodologies from the arts, etc., mm-hmm. and, and really from software design processes. So we do a lot of user interface and user experience mm-hmm. testing. Um, which goes into the research on how to design uh, these things. And then for the impact on learning, um, it's a lot of things because there's, um, well, did you do better on the test? So so that's that's an easy one to do. So Mm -hmm. you just kind of either compare your intervention cohort with like the 50 years that came before Mm -hmm. and and look at, you know, have you you made a difference? Or you do the two cohort study or, you know, those types of things. But oftentimes you don't see a big effect because my students, being medical students, they're highly selected, they're really bright. I always say you put them in a dark room with a bunch of books, they'll figure it out. Like they, <laughs> you know, they will learn despite of what we do. Mm-hmm. So kind of finding big differences is often difficult. So then there's the question of, well, do you like the brain better now? Mm. When you mm-hmm. see a patient with a neurological deficit, mm-hmm. do you run for the hills? and kind of just scream, neurologist, please, somebody help, I can't <laughs> deal with this. Or do you, do you now have an approach? Right. And can you now do the first screening mm-hmm. so that we can then, uh, that you can then move on to the next method mm-hmm. or the next uh, level of healthcare? So it's, um, it's really, I guess, multifactorial how you mm-hmm. approach that research. And it's interesting because in order to get published in my field, you would very much need to have your two cohort crossover or whatever. Right. And you need to, if you don't have a p-value, then you know, it's already failed. Um, and so kind of changing the culture there, that the research approaches in this environment can be a little bit different. It's right. a sort of an evolving conversation. That I can having. imagine that it could be a, yeah. a lively and spirited uh, yeah. faculty to faculty or even journal. Like It's between journals and reviewers. Yeah. Like yeah. You have no p-value. It's like, well, okay. But, but we made a brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Conrad, can you talk about something where, you know, iterative research, one-man pipeline, yeah. like what was where something where you're like, well, uh, my background has, has failed me <laughs> and I have not achieved the goal that I wanted, but have you been able to like recycle any of those experiences and further work that you've done? Or it's just been <laughs> success all the way? No, it hasn't. It's Pure really not. Because like the, when it gold. comes to, like, the past two years of my work have been, you know, simulating architectural environments. Mm-hmm. And there's just so many variables that go towards producing a photorealistic result that you're often confronted time and time again with something that just looks wrong to us and then you have to figure out why. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and so why why does 
the carpet look like a piece of cardboard when it's supposed to be a carpet or something, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we are, or like you know when you're animating something and, and simulating the animation, uh, the uncanny valley. Like we're so easy, we're, we're so good at detecting inaccuracies in these things. Mm -hmm. So iteration is a big thing, and being able to do it quickly mm -hmm. is a really big thing. Um, so um, working in real time uh, with game engines and, and in VR and these kinds of tools can help you make iterations a lot more rapidly mm -hmm. and uh, sort of understand those those problems that can occur. Um, yeah. Uh, what was the probably the biggest failure I had? Uh, <laughs> I think I was trying to simulate just like a cup of coffee, you know, mm -hmm. and it just ended up looking like jello. <laughs> I mean, kind of yummy, right? Yeah. Like coffee jello? Steaming. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to look, I had to research the yeah, refraction indices of coffee mm -hmm. and, and like why, you know, the fall offs of, the, you know, like how to get it to look more uh, realistic. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tyan, you know, you have such a wonderfully research and theory informed practice with Hamilton Perambulatory Unit. Does that fly like within the discipline, you know, within with in cinema and media arts or other are, are people open to that, or is it more like intuitive on the set kind of work and experience, or is it somewhere on a continuum? Um, I, I actually, we work a lot outside of um, academia, mm -hmm. like in uh, you know art gallery spaces or artist-run center spaces, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we don't get you know we don't get so theory heavy in right. those those scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, this is more like when I'm at a conference, right? Yeah, so it's right. like a yeah, different exactly. um, mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. So at a conference, I'll, I'll pull up Lefebvre and, yeah. you know, De Silto and go, oh, yeah, these are some of the, the theorists we're wor working with. Makes sense. Um, in general, though, we will uh, not be so theory heavy. Yeah. Right. Are there questions for our panel? Yes. Um, so the question I have is, is um, as part of research creation, what are some of the ways that you're actually recording and sharing your research creation mm -hmm. um, in, in, in your own field and then beyond your field? Uh, <laughs> look at the guy with the bulk uh, I just saw a, like, on a blog that, you know, sure. has Blogs. been collecting dust for a little while, but uh, just my own personal, like, repository of notes and, and uh, my research, um, you know, has predominantly just been laser focused on understanding the hardware and the, the platforms on which to produce um, uh, creative works with others. Um, but, but in terms of like theoretical and, and conceptual um, research, uh, I don't often document it. Uh, I just kind of let it sit in my head and, uh, and see where it leads me, um, what kind of projects can come out of it by just kind of enigmatically existing in my head. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's just me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't use Instagram, social media much, it's just kind of my own personal blog and, and diaries and stuff. Mm -hmm. We have to keep a bit of an institutional memory because we have a big multidisciplinary team with turnover students and everything, so mm -hmm. we need to um, have a method of documenting our successes and our failures so that we don't repeat the failures. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we mm -hmm. do, but you know, we try our best not to. So everything between sort of our GitHub repository mm -hmm. to um, just documenting in a Word document how to, you know, what the process is and, and best practices and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then for the academic side, well, we publish it in mm -hmm. academic journals. Right when the reviewers accept that we have no key value. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you, reviewer number two. <laughs> oh my god, I hate that one. Yeah, I know, that guy. <laughs> that guy, that I know. Guy. Yeah, we try and do all of it, right? We have a website where we have like all our events, but you know, we have a blog too that is a little bit dusty because it's, it's so much admin work, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's trying a to, it, job. yeah, yeah. like it you is, have to document yeah. everything and you have to write it up and yeah. then, so we just don't get around to. So I looked at our, our, our website the other day and I was like, oh, we have we don't have 
you know, we, d- we were in Tokyo last year, and we don't have that on. And yeah, it's a big like, deal. It's a lot yeah, of... Yeah, so tough. It's, it's tough. It's mm-hmm. tough. It's yeah. money. It's, like, resource. And as you were saying, like, sometimes you have the grant to support someone to do that documentation and work with you mm-hmm. while you're... Yeah. Just speaking off the top of my head here. <laughs> no context. Um, so you said sometimes you do have those people that can do yes. those helpful documentation roles mm-hmm. while yeah. you're, you know, I think wearing, like, we're going back to hats, but wearing yeah. all the hats um, at once is a lot of pressure to, like, be, be sort of, you know, like, in the creation intuitive mode, but at the same time being like, I'm going to write all of this down mm-hmm. so that I can share it for the ages. And also, what's a great idea and what's a garbage idea? And, like, you know, do I need to be writing everything down all the time? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. It is helpful. Helpful to have all the notes <laughs> so know, you can right? go, okay, these are the garbage ideas <laughs> that you remember what they right. are so you don't do them again. Right. And, um, you know, and, and just like video, yeah. photography, like always try to get someone to, you know, photograph things when we're on our walks. We document, we try to document all of our maps, mm-hmm. you know, and the other in like in a folder somewhere <laughs> on my desk, <laughs> like... Okay, I have to like scan them sometimes. So again, the backlog of documentation. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, and then the publication, right? Which also takes a lot of time. Like, mm-hmm. so I'm working on something now, like an essay that we did uh, on a walk that we did in 2018, right? And it's only going through the review process now, like second review process now. Yep. So it's hard to be up to date when the processes take so long. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions? Um, what what do you think, I mean, we've talked a lot about failures, but what do you think is like your signature success that you're hoping to build upon for the next project? Like what are you, what's in the pipeline for research that right now, research creation right now? I thought now? you were going to say what's your signature failure. Yeah. <laughs> My God, signature real failure. stinkers up here. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, do you, what are you hopeful about? What's on the, what's next? Like what's, what's in the mix in terms of research creation at the moment? <laughs> We're trying to create something for um, remote access to oh. education. So mm-hmm. what we are dealing with here in British Columbia is a really big province um, with um, people who want to receive medical or health professional education in all corners of the province. Mm-hmm. But if you're not in Vancouver, you don't have access to some physical things. Like right. You don't have access to an anatomy lab or the, to the pathology collection at mm-hmm. EGH. And so what we're doing now is digitizing that in terms of 3D photogrammetry mm-hmm. scans and creating an environment where you can access that from anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so now, oh, so we've, we have that as a working prototype, and now the next step is to create a fully sort of immersive um, teaching environment there mm-hmm. so that you can go into this place wow. and study those uh, specimens and, um, you know, have a, a virtual professor kind of t- ask you questions mm-hmm. and then... Um, you'll have to start answering them and, and interacting with it so that you can simulate the physical um, lab space, mm-hmm. but you can do it in a remote area. Um, so we're hoping to get that going by the fall because we're in a little bit of pressure. Midwifery education is going to be offering sort of a rural cohort with, who can do their education in their remote communities mm-hmm. without having to come to Vancouver. So hopefully we'll be able to offer that. ready to do that, yeah. yeah. Hmm. No pressure. It's just the next generation. That's no big all. deal. No big deal. Yeah, that's all. It's <laughs> fine. It's fine. What about you? Um, I'm working right now with uh, my friend Debbie Wong, who owns an opera company, mm-hmm. and uh, sh- she was very interested in exploring sort of new media, um, the cross section of, of like VR and um, opera, and mm-hmm. so we're working on a little prototype. Uh, that explores that and doing motion capture for the for the performances of the opera singers and mapping the, those to digital characters and creating a, a, a version of Orpheus in that mm-hmm. way. And we wow. we've explored using VR technology in a lot of different ways. So doing the storyboarding for the prototype, uh, I used VR to paint the storyboards. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, yeah, uh, but there's you know there's there's so many things to learn there too, especially regarding the development of convincing and uh, performance light uh, assets for uh, a mobile VR platform, mm-hmm. which is, is it's very challenging to approach using um, like the Oculus Quest, for example, or the Oculus Go as, you know, these are accessible VR headsets, mm-hmm. um, you know, because VR technology is still so 
you need you need you need a substantial investment to get into it yeah um, in a deep way that's and right it's very inaccessible in, in some ways mm -hmm. uh, so how can we approach uh, creatively uh, driving um, a viable opera uh, <laughs> which is already a niche and VR is it's like a turbo niche <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so it's, it, it's an interesting uh, I'm not sure how far we'll go with it, but it's, yeah. it's been really fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. So again, what's what are you working on? So um, moving forward, so a lot of our work is like these relational workshops, mm -hmm. right? That um, create an audience and uh, these this experience together. And so what I want to do next is actually get into dome. VR, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because it's because the you know the VR experience is such a solitary experience. We used to get headset yeah. on, mm -hmm. so we're like, oh, what if we make it a dome and yeah. you can actually have VR experiences as groups, right? And what would that be to have like this whole uh, bringing the audience back into the VR? Yeah, and um, uh, and that coalesces with our place and space research because often a dome is you know transporting you into another place. For sure. Yeah, so we can use a lot of like 360 mm -hmm. in that as well, but but I don't have a workflow for, for that yet. So yeah, it's totally that's, new. that's the next step. A bunch of yeah. projectors. Yeah. A bunch of projectors. A lot of projectors. And <laughs> I don't know what else. Some, some spherical cameras, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah see, it's happening right here. <laughs> yeah. Here I know. think I saw a question in the back. Was there still one, Jacob? Um, I guess in that question, like. Uh, so, being the person from the north, I'll say digital divide. Um, like how, yeah. in this question of low bandwidth, they're talking about remote places. Um, I mean, I'll you know the 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 monthly bandwidth allowance is burnt through in a in a sort of quick run through yeah. the PS4 download mm -hmm. process, right? Yeah. Like it's it's a very different reality of what's what's usable and what's fast and what's good enough and, and also what you can assume, assume a user has, let alone owns, but has used before. Um, and how much in this crossover from gaming, which I understand why economically they don't think about, like 30,000 people in the Yukon is not a market, mm -hmm. um, but how is that being thought about when you're developing like kind of high bandwidth or, or questions of fidelity. You raised a sort of fidelity question. And is there a interest in low fidelity for high distribution trade-offs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, you have to make certain compromises and concessions um, in that way to, to reach a, a larger audience for sure. And, uh, and preparing to do that is, is very vital to succeeding and doing it, right? So, um, knowing exactly, uh, for, like just as as a detail, uh, what is the polygon budget for an Oculus Quest? How many Oculus Quests exist in Canada, right? And 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 then seeing where you can go from there. The other thing is really an investment in infrastructure, mm -hmm. and that's I think beyond what we as the creators can do. But for example, when the um, medical program at UBC expanded to the Northern Medical Program and the Island Medical Program initially. Um, infrastructure, actual fiber optic pathways were put in the ground between Vancouver and Prince George mm -hmm. so that we could have real-time video conferencing yeah. with the cohort in Prince George. That was a government investment in mm -hmm. infrastructure um, because there was a need for that. And I think if we are able to offer um, high quality education uh, in sort of the virtual or sort of technology enhanced environment um, and there's an, a political will for it, then those same fiber optic lines can be brought all the way up into the Yukon um, to, for example, educate midwives in the Yukon mm -hmm. so that people who are giving birth in the Yukon can actually do that there. Right? I mean, there's... Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and especially if we're talking about things like indigenous communities and all of that, the barriers for coming to Vancouver for health education are much higher if we can keep people in their home communities and give them the same quality of education. This is, I mean, it's a political decision at yeah. that point. Are you going to invest in that? So, like, I'm curious, like, is um, discovering where the political will lies, like, is it just a lot of uh, like 
poking and prodding and figuring out where where the government or county council or whatever is interested in putting funds? Yeah, just As always, <laughs> it, I mean, to go back to the climate crisis, yeah. are you going to invest in more um, pipelines and tar sands development? Or are mm. you going to invest in a future of um, sort of a knowledge uh, society and, and support that type of infrastructure. I mean, this is, these are the people we elect, right? That yeah. we have to yeah. make. Mm -hmm. yeah. So activism is so important to poke and prod yeah. where yes. we get, yeah. where that infrastructure goes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and you might, yeah. you might succeed in your poking, you may not, but it's, mm -hmm. yeah. gotta it's do important it. to try. Gotta, gotta poke, away. poke away. Poke away. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, thank you to our thank panel. You. Thank you so much. I think Aisha, do you want to do a yeah. quick, quick pick? All right. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh -huh. yeah. no, quick pick, right? Yeah, yeah picture. Pick. All right. <laughs> Well, they're, well, they're taking a photo. I'm going to take all of them. Come close, <laughs> I've got the the lectern mic, the handheld mic, and 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 a lav on, <laughs> just in case they can't hear me at the back. Um, here we are. Yeah, that was a great day. It's not done yet. Oh, yeah. But we wanted to say thank you again to the folks here at UBC for hosting us. Patrick in particular, Patrick Rizzotti, that is. We got lots of, we got, we're lousy with Patrick's here, uh, which is just wonderful. Yeah, and uh, especially to the Canada Council for the Arts for their support for the Digital Strategy Fund and allowing us to have these conversations where we can rack up all the things uh, that we don't know and all the things that are challenges. We are going to transition uh, the space a little bit, open it up from this presentational format, um, say goodbye to our friends at a distance. Uh, we have a few different demonstrations that, that we've put out here and we'll have the makers in the room to be able to have those uh, conversations as well. And like I said before, we'll also be able to include some of that on the documentation of the event. Mm -hmm. So uh, this will eventually get archived through HowlRound. It will get archived through the Toaster Lab site as well. And then for all, we'll have uh, a set of links to all of the projects. So if there's anything that you heard about today uh, that you didn't see enough of, or you'd like to see more of, mm -hmm. uh, then you'll have the ability to do that. Uh, ToasterLab.com slash Atelier uh, has an archive, an, uh, an ongoing archive of the entire two-year cycle of this project. Uh, so you can also find all the things from Toronto there. A couple of those projects came up uh, today. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Before we break to that, are there any general questions? Then we will say thank you and uh, goodbye to those at home. And thank everybody you to our group here who, for coming. Thanks, yes. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to, yeah, here in the room, there's that are going to get set up with.